Okay guys, in this video we are going to be talking about um, periodicity and the periodic table. Uh, and the idea here is that there are a number of atomic properties uh, that show a periodic structure. That is, they, uh, the observations that we see amongst the different atoms, they follow certain trends uh, with respect to their placement in the periodic table. These include atom size, uh, Ion, ionic radii, ionization energies, and we'll also talk a little bit about electron affinities at the end. So uh, this idea of a periodic law states that when you arrange the elements by their atomic number, uh, various physical and, and chemical properties vary periodically across the periodic table. That is, you see uh, regular trends uh, amongst the different atoms, uh, and they line up with respect to their uh, group numbers. And so we're going to look at a few of these in this video. We'll start with the covalent and ionic radius, and then we'll look at the ionization energy and a quantity called the electron affinity. So uh, a covalent radius is an estimate that we use uh, for the size of an atom, and this covalent radius is calculated through um, bond length data. So by looking at uh, the compounds uh, involving different um, different atoms, uh, we can deduce what is roughly the size of the of a given atom. Uh, and the trend that we see is that the radius of an atom increases as you go down the periodic table, and it decreases as you go across the periodic table. As you go down the periodic table, uh, the rationalization is somewhat obvious. Uh, as you go down the periodic table, you are adding more electrons. And each time you go down a row in the periodic table, uh, you switch to a larger electron shell. And so the size of the atom increases uh, because that electron shell is further from the nucleus as you go down the periodic table. Uh, within, a periodic ta within a given row of the periodic table, uh, however, uh, the trend is different. Rather than increasing as you go uh, across the periodic table, uh, the, the radius of an atom decreases. And the reason is, um, is explained here. So as you go across the periodic table, you stay within the same electronic shell. That is, you're just adding electrons to a given subshell. So the, the shell is at roughly the same distance um, when you go across the periodic table. However, what does increase is the atomic number of the atom. So there's more protons in the nucleus as you go across the periodic table. And the more protons there are, the stronger are the interactions, attractive interactions, between the nucleus and the electrons. And so as you add more protons to the nucleus, this tends to hold the electrons in that subshell a little bit more closely. And so here is a graphic uh, depicting uh, relative covalent radii for the different atoms. And so as you see, when you go down the periodic table, the radii get larger and larger, right? However, as you go across the periodic table, the radii more or less just get smaller and smaller. Uh, notice that the trend when you go across the periodic table is a smaller trend, that is the magnitude of the of the covalent radius changes by a smaller amount than when you go down the periodic table. Right? You get a big change when you go from hydrogen to lithium and a big change when you go from lithium to sodium. But as you go across the periodic table from lithium to beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, you see that the, um, the size doesn't change that much but indeed it does get smaller. Okay? So the main trend is that when you go down the periodic table the atomic radii get larger when you go across the periodic table in this direction, uh, the radii get smaller. Here is another way of depicting that information. So here we're plotting the radius as a function of atomic number. And so when you go here in hydrogen and helium, you're in a 1s, or you're in the n equals 1 shell of the atom. When you go to the n equals 2 shell, that is when you jump from the first row of the periodic table to the second row, you see that you get a big jump in the radii. And then as you go across the periodic table, they decrease until you get to neon. Then you get a big jump when you jump down a row uh, to sodium, and then they decrease a little bit. Then 
after argon, when you switch to a new row of the periodic table, you get a big jump for potassium, and then it decreases again. And so this is what we mean by a periodic law. A property varies periodically with the atomic number. Um, let's see. So here in this problem, what we're being asked to do uh, is to predict the ordering of uh, various atoms, various selected atoms, uh, list the order of increasing covalent radius. And so in order to solve these types of problems, you need the periodic table. So I'm going to pull that up. And then you need to know the periodic trend for whatever property you're talking about. So in this case, we're talking about the covalent radius. And so we need to know when you go down the periodic table, the radius increases. When you go across the periodic table, because you're adding more protons to the nucleus, the, sh the shell, the subshell, gets, gets pulled in a little bit more closer to the nucleus. And so the radius decreases as you go across. So if you know those two trends, you can answer questions like this. And so we're being asked to, to rank aluminum, carbon, and silicon uh, in terms of increasing covalent radius. So what you need to do is locate those on the periodic table. So we've got aluminum here carbon here, and silicon. So we have these three atoms. And so we want to figure out which one is going to be the smallest and which one's going to be the largest. Well, aluminum and silicon are in the n equals 3 uh, shell, whereas carbon is in the n equals 2 shell. And so that means that carbon is going to be smaller than both uh, aluminum and silicon. And so carbon is going to be the smallest of the three. And then we need to figure out, okay, which of the remaining two, aluminum or silicon, is going to be larger. And we need to know that when you go across the periodic table, the atomic radii get smaller. So silicon is going to have a smaller radius than aluminum. So it would be silicon next, and then aluminum would be the largest of the three. Uh, for part B, it's the same exercise, just a different set of atoms. So we've got this time sodium, magnesium, and beryllium. And just like before, the atom that has the smaller valence shell is going to be the smaller one. So beryllium is going to be the smallest in this case. When you go down the periodic table, the radii get larger, so beryllium is going to be the smallest. Now we're comparing sodium and magnesium. Okay. Uh, Again, the, the radii get smaller as you go across the periodic table. So sodium is going to be smaller than magnesium. For part C, it's the same ideas. This time we're talking about germanium, this fluorvoium, uh, bromine, which is here, and krypton, which is right here. So once again, it's germanium. Uh, bromine, krypton, and then this, this strange one down here at the bottom, this fluorovium. Uh, obviously, fluorovium is in the N equals 7 shell, so it is going to be the largest one. So I'm just going to put that one over here. And then now we've just got to deal with germanium, bromine, and krypton. We notice that they're all in the same row. We note that the rule is as you go across the periodic table, the atom sizes get smaller. And so krypton is going to be the smallest. Bromine will be the next smallest. And then germanium is going to be the largest in the set, in that set of three. And then this fluorovium is the largest among all of them. Um, let's see, what do I have on the next slide here? Okay, so uh, next we're going to talk about ionic radii. Ionic radii are estimated from um, crystal structure data. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, crystal structures in a later chapter, but for, for now you can. there are experiments that you can do where you can estimate the size of an ion uh, from a data set. Uh, the trend is the same as the covalent radius. So as you go down the periodic table, the ionic radii increase, and as you go across the periodic table, the ionic radii decrease. Uh, there's a couple of other rules here because we're dealing with ions. First, cations are always smaller than their parent ion, or than their parent atom. So here's uh, comparing aluminum 
to aluminum 3 plus, you see that the cation is smaller than the aluminum. Anions, on the other hand, when you add electrons, they get larger than their parent, parent atom. Uh, and so this, this word should say, instead of saying ion here, this is a typo, it should say parent atom. And so you see that the uh, sulfide is larger than the parent atom sulfur. When you're comparing cations and anions within the same period, uh, cations are um, uh, be, the larger the charge, the larger the, the plus charge, the smaller the ion. For anions, however, the larger the negative charge, the larger the ion. And then as a general rule, uh, within the same row, the cations are smaller than the, than the anions. And so we have another set of, um, of atoms that we want to compare. Uh, let me get my periodic table back up. And we'll go through um, this set of four here for, for these different ions. So looking at one we've already seen, sulfur and sulfide, right? The anion is always larger than the parent atom. So sulfur is going to be smaller than the sulfide ion. When you add electrons, the species gets larger. Uh, here we're comparing strontium, magnesium, and calcium ions. So here we've got uh, magnesium, calcium, and strontium. We see that they're all in the same column, the same group of the periodic table. And as you go down the periodic table, the ionic radii increase. And so uh, the magnesium ion is going to be smaller than the, than the calcium cation, and that's going to be smaller than the strontium cation. In part C, we're comparing uh, different cations and, um, and anions. So we have fluoride over here, magnesium on this side, and oxide here. So we want to break this down. Um, let's think about it. Let's think about what's happening here. So when you make a magnesium 2 plus cation, you take off the first electron and then the second electron. Right? So if you lose two electrons, that means that the magnesium cation has as many electrons as a neon atom. Uh, when, fluoride, when fluorine gains an electron to become fluoride, it has the same number of electrons as a neon atom. And oxygen, when it gains two electrons, one, two, it has the same number of electrons as a neon atom. We say that these three species are isoelectronic. They all have the same number of electrons. Uh, which is going to be larger? Which is going to be smaller? The secret to answering that question is to consider the number of protons within the nucleus of these ions. The one that has the most uh, protons in it is going to exert a greater force of attraction on the electrons. And so in this case, uh, magnesium has more protons than both fluorine and oxygen. And so in the magnesium 2 plus cation, the magnesium is going to be pulling those electrons more closely to it than both fluorine and oxygen. So the magnesium cation is going to be smaller than the two anions. The uh, fluorine has more protons in it than oxygen, and so the fluoride ion is going to be smaller than the oxide ion, and the oxide ion is going to be the largest ion in this set. Okay, so sometimes you have to count up how many protons, you know, for species that have the same number of electrons, you have to, you have to figure out how many protons are in the nucleus. The one with the larger protons pulls the electrons in closer, and so it's going to be a smaller ion. Uh, let's do another set. Let's do the chlorine, the chloride, calcium 2 plus, and then the phosphide. If you look carefully, calcium 2 plus, take away one electron, then another electron, the calcium 2 plus is going to be isoelectronic with argon. Uh, likewise, the chloride ion, if you add an electron to chlorine, it's going to be isoelectronic with argon. For phosphorus, if you add three electrons to make phosphide, the phosphate ion is going to be isoelectronic with argon. So all three species here are isoelectronic. They all have the same number of electrons corresponding to the n equals 3 
uh, shell being completely filled. Which one is going to be smaller, which one is going to be larger, is going to depend upon the number of protons in the nucleus. Uh, calcium is going to have the largest number of electrons among the, uh, the largest number of protons in the, in the nucleus for each of these three species, and as a consequence of that, it's going to be the smallest of the ions. Uh, followed by chloride, and then the species with the most number of protons will be the phosphide species. Sorry, the fewest number of protons will be the phosphide species. And so the electrons in the phosphide are not held as closely as the electrons in the chloride uh, and in the, in the calcium ion. And so therefore it has the largest, the largest uh, ionic radius. Well, on the next slide we're going to be talking about uh, another uh, periodic property, uh, the uh, ionization energy. Uh, the ionization energy refers to the minimum energy that is needed to pull an electron, the highest energy electron, uh, from the neutral atom uh, when the atom is in the gaseous state. So here is a chemical reaction depicting the ionization process. You have some atom X in the gaseous state. You add some energy, and there's different ways you can do that, uh, often by uh, applying an electric voltage, or you can you can also use um, uh, light energy, strong uh, typically in the UV range. Um, you can use that light to pull electrons off of the atom, and that's going to give you a gaseous cation, and it's going to pull off an electron. This is typically an endothermic reaction. In fact, it always is. It takes energy to pull electrons off of atoms. And so uh, this is an endothermic process. The ionization energies are positive. Uh, the trend is, is that as you go down the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. That is, it becomes easier and easier to pull electrons uh, off of an atom uh, when, when, the, uh, when, when you're in the higher numbered periods. Uh, it also increases as you go um, well, I should say it, the ionization energy decreases as you go down the periodic table. However, as you go across the periodic table, it increases. And the reason for this trend is that it's easier to pull electrons out of the larger shells because those larger shells are further away from the nucleus. Therefore, it's easier to remove the electrons. Uh, however, when you're in the same period, again, we have this trend with the number of protons. As you go across the periodic table, you're in the same shell. So the electrons are, are still, they're, they're basically the same distance away from the nucleus. However, uh, the protons, the number of protons in the nucleus increases. And the more protons there are in the nucleus, the harder it is to pull the electrons off of the atom. And so that's why, as you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. Okay, and so we're going to do the same thing that we did before with the radii for the, uh, for the, uh, for the ionization energies. In this graph, uh, it's showing you the trend as you go, um, let's say, as you go across the periodic table, so as you go from hydrogen to helium, you see that the ionization energy increases. But then as you make a jump down to the next period, you see that there's a big drop in the ionization energy. And then as you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. Then you, when you drop down to the next row, you see that there's a big drop in the ionization energy as you go from neon to sodium. And then it increases again until you get to argon, and then it drops when you go to potassium. And then it increases across the periodic table until you get to krypton, and then it drops for rubidium and increases again. Notice that all of these little spikes here, these are the noble gas, uh, these are the noble gas atoms. So it's very difficult to pull an electron out of a noble gas atom. Conversely, it's easy to pull electrons off of a alkali metal. These are the group one uh, atoms. So it's easy to pull electrons off of a group one atom. It's difficult to pull electrons off of a noble gas atom. Uh, you can also have uh, successive ionization energies. So there's an ionization energy one for pulling the first electron off. Then there's an ionization energy 2 
for pulling a second electron off, and an ionization energy 3 for pulling off a third electron, and so on. Uh, so you can have double and triple and quadruple ionizations, etc. And what we see is that the ions that are isoelectronic with the noble gas electronic configuration, they have large ionization energies. So let's take a look at uh, potassium. Potassium is a group 1 uh, metal, an alkali metal, and it has a fairly low first ionization energy. That is, it's relatively easy to pull an electron off of potassium. However, once you pull that electron off, potassium plus, the, the potassium cation, uh, it's isoelectronic with the noble gas. And so if you look at the second ionization energy, you see that it's quite a bit larger in magnitude than the first ionization energy. Okay? The difference between the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy is very large for potassium. For calcium, the first ionization energy isn't too big. It's a little bit larger than potassium's because calcium has more protons in it. The second ionization energy, however, is not nearly as large as the second ionization of potassium. Right? This is going to give you a, a so, so this first one, this gives you a, a calcium plus ion. This one gives you a calcium 2 plus ion. The calcium 2 plus ion is isoelectronic with the noble gas atom. And that's a very stable electronic configuration. To pull an electron from that requires a tremendous uh, amount of energy. That is, you have to increase, that is the ionization energy, the third ionization energy for calcium is very large compared to the second ionization energy for calcium. So you have to put quite a lot more energy in to get that third electron out. Uh, for, you know, and, and for these other atoms we have we have other trends as well that are that are very similar that once you reach that noble gas configuration the next ionization energy is very very large so in this uh, in this problem we're being asked to rank the ionization energies for different atoms and we need to use our periodic table to do that and the, the trend is for ionization energy as you go down the periodic table, it gets easier and easier to pull the electron out. And so the ionization energy gets smaller as you go down the periodic table. As you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. Okay? So ionization energy, ionization energy increases as you go down the, it decreases as you go down the periodic table, and it increases as you go across the periodic table. So what we're being asked to do are to rank the first ionization energies for these different species. So here we've got argon, we've got selenium, and we've got sulfur. So argon, sulfur, and selenium. Which one is going to be the easiest to ionize? Well, it's going to be the selenium because it's in the largest shell. Right? It's in the n equals 4 shell. And so it's going to be relatively easy to pull an electron off of selenium. So selenium is the smallest. Okay? And now we have two that we're comparing that are in the same row. We've got argon and sulfur. Now the trend is, as you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. And so argon is going to have the largest ionization energy, and sulfur will be the one in the middle. The noble gas atoms, they have very stable electronic configurations, and so it's very difficult to ionize argon compared to sulfur and the other atoms in the row, particularly sodium. Sodium is going to have uh, the smallest in this row of the periodic table. Uh, looking at the, uh, the next ones that we want to compare, oxygen, polonium, lead, and barium. Okay, so we've got oxygen way up here. And then down here, we've got polonium, lead, barium's on this side. Okay, so, so these three, these are all in the same periodic, uh, the same period of the periodic table. Oxygen is way up here. It is going to be difficult to pull an electron out of oxygen compared to the other ones because these guys, they have 
a very large shell. The n equals 6 shell is much, much larger than the n equals 2 shell. And so oxygen is going to be the most difficult one to ionize. So oxygen is going to be on this side here. And then now we're going to start comparing, comparing things that are in the same row. The barium, the lead, the polonium. Uh, and as you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. So since polonium is the one that's furthest over in this row, uh, polonium would be the next highest one, followed by the lead. And then the easiest to ionize would be the barium. Uh, this next one is a little complicated because not only is it asking us to compare first ionization energies, some of them they want us to compare are um, successive ionization energies. So the second ionization energy for sodium compared to the third ionization energy for um, aluminum. And so let's try to find where these atoms are. So we've got aluminum here, first ionization energy for aluminum, and then first ionization energy for thallium down here. Then we've got the third ionization energy for aluminum, and then the second ionization energy for sodium. So we want to first find out what's going to be the easiest one to ionize. Well, that's going to be the one with the largest shell. So that's going to correspond to the thallium. So the first one is going to be the first ionization energy for thallium. That's going to be the smallest ionization energy. Uh, what would be next? Well, uh, we're comparing aluminum, first ionization energy for aluminum, to the second ionization energy for sodium, and the third ionization energy for aluminum. Well, we know that uh, aluminum is going to be greater than the thallium, the ionization energy. But then of these two, comparing the first ionization energy for aluminum to the third ionization energy for aluminum, we know that aluminum is going to, the first ionization energy is going to be smaller than the third one. So the next one on our list should be the first ionization energy of aluminum. And then we have to decide between the second ionization energy for sodium and the third ionization energy for aluminum. So let's see what, what happens here when we ionize aluminum. The first ionization energy takes us to magnesium. The second one takes us to the sodium uh, electronic configuration. And then the third ionization energy takes us to neon. Well, that neon electronic configuration is quite stable, and so it's not that hard to ionize aluminum to aluminum 3 plus because that's the electronic configuration that it wants. However, for sodium, the first ionization energy takes you to the neon configuration right away, and then the second ionization energy is going to start removing those core electrons, and it's going to take you to the fluorine electronic configuration. But sodium's got a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of protons in the nucleus, so that is a you know, that's going to be an expensive uh, ionization to go from neon's electronic configuration to fluorine's electronic configuration. So of these two, the ionization energy three for aluminum versus the ionization energy two for sodium, the ionization energy three for aluminum is going to be smaller than the ionization energy two for sodium. So we would rank them in this order. Okay, and so these are the types of comparisons that you need to be able to make. Again, this one is extra complicated due to the fact that they're having us compare successive ionizations for some of them. Uh, but the other two are relatively simple as long as you know that periodic trend. If you don't know the periodic trend, then it's very hard to do. And the trend is, as you go down the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. As you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. Well, our last um, periodic trend is called electron affinity, and I use the, the term trend very loosely because of the four that we've talked about, the, electronic, the electron affinity is the least periodic of the four, uh, and you'll see when I show you the, uh, the numbers in a second. Um, also, uh, it, electron affinity is also complicated by the fact that Different textbook authors use different definitions of electronic affinity. Uh, I've seen two versions. 
One involves an electron capture reaction, uh, which is an exothermic process. So you have an atom in its gaseous state. It, um, uh, it obtains an electron to give you the uh, anion in its gaseous state. Uh, that usually releases energy. The other way I've seen it defined is the opposite of that, a so-called electron detachment reaction, where you have the anion in the gaseous state and then it gives up an electron. Obviously, if, if the electron capture is usually exothermic, then the electron uh, detachment would be usually endothermic. Our textbook uses the electronic capture reactions, and so that's what we're going to stick with. So we are going to take this to be the electronic affinity. Uh, electron affinities are usually negative. And so uh, here is a, a table showing you electron affinities for different atoms. And the trend is, as you go across the periodic table, the magnitude of the electron affinity increases. That is, you get more energy um, out when the atom uh, grabs an electron. The larger the larger and more negative the value of the electronic affinity, the easier it is to form the ion to some extent. So the more stable the anion is. So the anions become more stable as you go across the periodic table and as you go up the periodic table. Now there's a lot of exceptions to that rule, okay? Many exceptions. And so that's why I consider the electron affinity to be the, the weakest of the periodic trends. Uh, here's a quick example, though, involving um, electronic affinity, electron affinity. Uh, which, which do we expect to have a larger, more negative electron affinity, carbon or fluorine? Well, the rule is, as you go across and up the periodic table, the electron affinities increase. So between the two, carbon is going to have the smaller electron affinity compared to fluorine. Uh, for the second part here, comparing aluminum and chlorine, aluminum is here, chlorine is over here, so we would expect aluminum to have the smaller electron affinity compared to the chlorine. Well, I think that's the last slide I have for, for this video. Uh, we are going to start with, um, this would be chapter 7, I believe, in the next one.